We want to thank Birch Living for sponsoring the show. Birch is a premium mattress in a box company that makes mattresses and sleep products that are stylish, comfortable, and environmentally conscious. And it's that last part, the environmentally conscious part, that really first got my attention because Birch makes organic, non-toxic mattresses made right here in America with just four materials sourced straight from nature. Organic latex, New Zealand wool, American steel springs, and organic cotton. Yeah, I've been sleeping on my Birch mattress for about a year now, and I love it for two big reasons. All right, what's the first reason? First of all, it's super comfortable. My girlfriend and I used to toss and turn way more with my old mattress. With my new Birch mattress, I find that we get much more restful sleep, and we both feel more energy in the morning. So what else? What's the second reason? Look, you're going to spend about a third of your life in your bed. And for me, I want a mattress that's going to be made out of organic and natural materials. Exactly. Birch is certified global organic textile standard, Green Guard Gold, Fair Trade, Eco Institute certified, Wool Integrity New Zealand, and Forest Stewardship Council. It's made sustainably, and that's important to us. And Birch Living just introduced their newest mattress, the Birch Lux Natural Mattress. The Lux takes the comfort and luxury of the original Birch mattress to the next level, and it's crafted with responsibly sourced and sustainably produced materials, including organic cashmere. The Lux is specifically created with breathability, cooling, and support in mind, and offers increased airflow and targeted zoned lumbar support. I actually think there's a third and a fourth reason you love your mattress that you may have forgotten about. Okay, it's how you got your Birch mattress and how you tested it. Oh, right. Possibly the best part. Birch delivers your mattress right to your door for free within the U.S. It comes rolled up in a box and it's super easy to set up for yourself. And the 100 night sleep trial. Right. Not only is it way easier than going into a store and honestly, at a mattress store, you're really going to be able to tell how a mattress is to sleep on. Yeah, you have to sleep on it. With Birch, you get more than three months to make sure that you love it. If you don't, they'll pick it up for you, and I mean right out of your bedroom, and you'll get a full refund. And Birch gives you peace of mind with a 25-year warranty. Look, if you've been dreaming about a new mattress, don't wait any longer. Use our link, birchliving.com slash now you know, and you'll get $400 off your Birch mattress plus two free pillows. Those pillows, by the way, are made from recycled plastic bottles. All right, so I'm so pleased to have uh, join us today, Smart Charge America founder and CEO, Joseph Barletta. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And before we kick it off, I just want to say thank you on behalf of all EV drivers, uh, both Tesla and non-Tesla, because if you've ever gone somewhere and you've seen a Tesla destination charger and there was a Clipper Creek uh, destination charger next to it, mm -hmm. there's a very good chance that Smart Charge America had something to do with that installation. Right. Um, and we're going to get into that today. So I'm so excited. And, and I want to thank you personally. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Zach and Jesse. Appreciate you guys having me here. It's been uh, uh, it's been an honor, man. We've been following you guys uh, since uh, back in, I guess, about 2015. Uh, if not, I believe you guys started your videos uh, somewhere around 2018, 2017. But we've been watching you guys ever since. Uh, some of the episodes that you guys do, uh, we broadcast on our on monitors, and I show the whole team a lot of y'all's content. So keep up the good work. You guys are pioneers and blazing that trail uh, on all things EV. So definitely appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you. And back so at much. you, because I think a lot of your installations is what kept us going on our road trips. I mean, without you, I mean, there was many trips, especially in the beginning <laughs> days, where, you know, the Supercharger Network wasn't fully built out and we really needed destination chargers. And so I'd like to get into that with you. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about, you know, what Smart Charge America does? Sure. So uh, we've installed about uh, oh, just a little over 11,000 charging stations all over the U.S. We're headquartered here in Austin, Texas, but we have satellite offices in 20 of the major EV-friendly cities across America. We're hoping to be in the top 50 uh, EV-friendly cities by 2025. So we got a, still a lot to, to go, a lot of charging to do. Um, I mean, but for us, um, our our mission is just to try to install enough charging stations uh, out there to, to hopefully move the needle uh, on climate change. I mean, we we are so passionate. We have a team of EV drivers. We're, uh, we're master electricians, but we know everything there is to know about every charging station ever made, uh, currently being made, and, and some of the future ones. So um, when you when you take all of those, like those three and you put them together, like that's almost the secret sauce of Smart Charge America. As far as uh, the destination charge program, I know that with Tesla, um, back in like 2000, 2015, uh, Tesla would um, 
they basically had a program where for each charging station that we would go in and install, Tesla would gift the 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 owner of the hotel or hospitality or retail center uh, fifteen hundred dollars towards their their installation. So if we're installing, let's say, three charging stations, well then Tesla would would give an allowance of let's say forty five hundred dollars towards that install. Now. Uh, we would go out on site and we would say, okay, well, owner uh, of the hotel, uh, this this installation is going to cost about $4,000. So good news. Um, we're going to build Tesla $4,000. Tesla's going to pay us $4,000. We're going to install your charging stations and it's completely free. Um, but if it was above the $4,500, then the owner would have to pay the difference uh, between that. And that's a really good program uh, that Tesla rolled out um, until, I guess, uh, about the... 2019, uh, they, they kind of slowed down on that. I think they, they were ramping up the Model 3 production, so forth and so on, and they had uh, a lot more fires uh, to, to tackle. And so we we basically kind of slowed down a little bit, and Tesla just now, they're, they're, we're starting to pick that program back up. And so I, th I thought that was that was pretty unique. We, you know, we, we just uh, released a, a video of the, the Gen 3 uh, wall connector with the J1772 uh, connector on it, and that, that charger to me is a absolute game changer. And so Tesla's going to be uh, basically using us to roll out these installations uh, across a, a number of different parking lots, mainly parking lots right now uh, for particular workplaces, high rise uh, buildings, so forth and so on. I loved watching your recent video you just mentioned on the Gen 3 charger. I didn't even know about this charger. Can you give me a little more information about it? Tesla's got uh, a, a thing that they're doing now with regards to the, the CCS connector with their superchargers. Uh, and we know, uh, I guess, you know, you guys are doing an amazing job on tracking the supercharger developments. And and I would say on average, you can see Tesla releasing or I guess opening about 10 new supercharging sites here in the U.S. per week. Uh, and so when you look at that, um, as, as Tesla starts to use the CCS combo connector um, to introduce universal chargers into their, their charging setup, I think what you're seeing with this new uh, Gen 3 wall connector, it's just that wall connector has a lot it scales out a lot more. You're able to get a lot more chargers in a parking garage as opposed to the Gen 3, I mean, the Gen 2 that they, they uh, opened up. I'd say they opened up for the on the website, man. You guys probably uh, know better than I do, but they they opened it up on the website for like two months or or maybe two weeks, and then they 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 shut it down. We do have a, a number of those those charging stations uh, in the back in stock, but what we see with the Gen 3. Tesla wall connector is the ability to go into a parking garage and install 30 charging stations uh, and basically connect on, on one panel or maybe two panels inside the, the building's electrical system. And that allows us to just to scale tremendously. And of course, they're, they're smart charging stations, so they're, they're speaking to one another, making sure that the energy doesn't exceed the electric capacity of the, the panel. And so when you have that, I think you're, you're going to see this blitzkrieg of what Tesla's doing um, with they're just blanketing parking garages left and right with as many of these charging stations that they can get in. Uh, just to help, um, you know, kind of the the adoption of electric vehicles, but also help complement um, and, and have that kind of offset from, hey, I know we don't have too many superchargers in, in your in your city, uh, but we have, you know, 600 destination charge, uh, you know, chargers now, uh, you know, within a, 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 I don't know, 12, maybe 13, 15 square, you know, a radius, mile radius uh, of the actual uh, downtown locations. I haven't heard about that. Yeah. That's that's really exciting. That is. And I mean, a couple points that you brought up about the Gen 3 that I just want to stress to people. So first of all, the Gen 3, as I was seeing in your video, no longer has a Tesla plug on the end, right? It has a J1772 plug on the end, which, of course, Teslas can use with the adapter. So that's great, right? Because now it's pretty much open to any EV. So it's not no longer that you pull up to a Tesla charger in your, in your bolt and you're like, oh, crap, I can't use this. That's right. That's right. Now, if you look at the connector uh, in the video, you can see the connector is just... It's almost, you can see some of the engineering prowess that actually went into the actual connector. It looks nothing like any other J1772 connector that you guys are, are used to seeing out there. It's a little shorter, it's a little more compact, uh, it's, a, it's a lot heavier built. Uh, you can actually see almost the, 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 the rubber cladding over the actual clutch uh, or the, um, the trigger uh, for the latch. 
Uh, you can see that they, they've, they've done a lot with regards to over-engineering it because they've seen a lot of the problems with electric vehicle infrastructure in the universal realm uh, where the, the, the connector drops on the ground and it drops at that perfect angle where the latch is broken down. And if that latch is broken, you're not going to charge anything because of the communication uh, you know, um, ports inside the actual charging station itself. We've seen some over-engineering and this is, uh, this is kind of the right, this is the right amount of engineering that, that has to kind of stand the test of time when it comes to charging. And I think it's going to do a, a really good job on almost increasing that uptime that we, we all struggle with with regards to public infrastructure um, because maybe a connector's loose or, or something's jammed with the communication pins on the inside. Uh, you can see that Tesla's engineering when they designed and they, they actually made this J1772 connector on this wall connector. It's, it's, it's just it's really nice. Uh, we're, we're really stoked to, to actually put these out in the wild. Um, Tesla has sent us a pallet or two of these. And so we're just waiting for approvals from some of the building estimates that we've gone in uh, and given to Tesla. Tesla gives us approval and then bam, we go out there and we just install as many as we can. So another point that you just brought up, which I really want to hit on for people out there who aren't electricians, is that uh, normally when you install a charger, it's using a lot of juice, right? So it's, you know, six kilowatts, maybe even more. And so if you want to, like you just said, put like say 30 in a parking lot, that means that normally you'd have to bring in so many amps to that location, which would be a big expense to what, you know, whatever it is, the hotel. But what you're saying is these Gen 3s are smart, so you can put 30 of them and you don't have to up the panel to, to enormous amounts, right? It can be a fairly small sub panel and basically they'll just talk to each other and like, you know, give what they need without maxing out the panel. And so that would slow down the charging. So if there was a big Tesla convention and everyone was was parked at that parking garage, all the, the cars would not be charging as fast, but you'd at least be charging something. Um, whereas if you were the only Tesla in there, you'd be getting, uh, you know, probably the max charging speed. Well, and in most cases, I don't even think you'd be limiting most of the cars, right? Because um, at any given time, unless you're right, there was a convention, <laughs> uh, there's, you know, usually you're not maxing out every single car with every single charger. But if they weren't smart, you'd have to dedicate kilowatts to every charger in case they were used. Right. So maybe you can speak to that a little bit, like that how this smart charging actually changes the cost of installation. Uh, tremendously. I mean, if you look at the electric code, so um, when, when an inspector goes out and they actually inspect the, uh, the uh, an electric car charging installation, um, with, they know that the, the car charger, one, it, it's pulling a max load, a continuous draw for a long period of time. So they're going to be really keen on exactly what type of charger, uh, and what type of load you're actually putting in. So if you're going in, let's say you have a two 200 amp panel um, and you have 40 spaces and you essentially have only enough capacity if you're putting in dumb chargers to put in relatively let's say a 50 amp breaker with a 40 amp continuous draw you probably can only put in close to about five charging stations before you, that that panel reaches its max so you have five slots in a 40 space panel and you can't use the panel at all because you know the dumb chargers are basically soaking up a lot of the capacity but with the gen 3 wall connectors you can actually you know give the the the, the stats and, and the specifications to the inspector and the inspector understands oh okay this is a smart metering system so it understands the load capacity of the panel and so therefore it's going to do what it, it needs to do on an intelligent basis to ensure that it does it never exceeds that capacity of the panel so when you when you you have that you can imagine the cost savings uh, from the building's owner uh, on this. We're maximizing the utilization of the electric panel to get the most out of the building's infrastructure that it, they're actually able to to give for electric vehicle charging. So for that, you know, I, I think we still have a long way to go. I think a lot of the buildings, what we're seeing these days, especially some of the newer buildings, they're being built with a little extra capacity um, just to make sure that they have enough uh, to tap into when you have 100% of the charging spaces uh, have to be reserved for electric car charging. So Wow. Okay. So what does this do to the charging speed? So if, if you know you come in and you could have put in five dumb chargers, but instead you put in 30 um, Tesla chargers, which is just awesome. Um, what uh, what does that do if it's, you know, Tesla convention and all the cars are charging um, in terms of, I mean, obviously, well, I don't know. You tell me. 
<laughs> yeah, so you know that not all cars are going to come in at the same power level, uh, same energy level, uh, or require the same amount of charging. And so, based on the uh, the battery pack capacity at the time, uh, when that charging when that that electric car is plugged in, um, it as it as all of the charging stations are communicating, it's going to give a little bit more power to the one that needs it the most first uh, until it starts to e- equalize. Uh, and then as 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 they're all kind of on the same page, they'll all kind of go up at the same level. Um, so this is this is some some incredibly smart, intuitive charging, uh, you know, kind of smart charging uh, design features that the Tesla wall connector uh, has has kind of instilled uh, inside of their wireless communicating. They all kind of wireless communicate with one another uh, and just make sure that, hey, this car needs this. Let's give this car this and a little bit to, to here. So so what what is it like if, if everyone pulled in? With a zero state of charge, and the the panels decided to split it evenly, how many kilowatts per car? It depends on the the amount of cars that are plugged in at the time. Remember, if you have a two hundred amp panel, we can only we can't exceed one hundred and sixty amps uh, continuous uh, for that particular load. So, if you're looking at let's say we have this thirty charging stations, and you're dividing it by uh, one hundred and sixty amps, uh, you still have two forty. So we know we have two forty there. Some buildings actually, if uh, bending on the commercial infrastructure. They may have 208, so it may be um, you know you're taking the amount of amps across the board uh, and multiplying that by 208 or 240. Um, so you're usually generally getting if you're let's say all 30 cars are parking, you're probably getting around uh, let's say 6 kW at a time. Um, but if let's say only 10 or five charging uh, cars are, are charging at the same time, you're going to get a lot more juice going to those those particular cars. And so it it all depends on how many cars are being charged at once and then of course uh how how much battery or how much energy or power capacity we actually have uh for those particular chargers i just did a little math here i did uh i did the worst case scenario so 208 volts 208 volts and that's for commercial uh basically two phase off of the three phase and then the uh, 160 amps divided by 30 that would be 1.1 kilowatts per car worst case no smart stuff right. which is still i mean that's about better than you, pulling in and getting nothing you know? and and i mean that's what you'd get at like a level well, one charger and, and that's what i want to ask joe here is like to me um early days of of charging a lot of places would put in like one charger and as an ev driver i don't think these places got it that like one charger isn't good because a it could be taken it could be broken if you can't reasonably expect to get that charger then it's kind of worthless whereas now you're talking you know 10 20 30 chargers you're definitely going to get a slot yeah so we have a phrase here if you can't charge you can't drive it's that simple so we take it pretty serious there's a difference between scalability and future growth so when we when we discuss future growth what we're talking about is um putting in oversized conduit uh, because we know that, hey, that charging station, it, it may take, uh, you know, 30 amps now, but we know that, you know, in, in the future, we're going to be able to do 48 a- amps or let's say 80 amps. Uh, so let's put in some extra size conduit now so that way we can just pull the, the old wire out and, and sleeve the new wire in. The reason why you have to put in oversized conduit is because when you're dealing with electrical wire, uh, Zach, you know this, you're, you're, you're a contractor. If you're putting in 40, si- 40 amp wire, you know, you're basically limited to the capacity of the the space inside the actual conduit itself. So you actually have a limit of what you can put in there. So if you're putting in 40 amp circuits uh, inside of, let's say, three quarter inch conduit, well, you can't put in 100 amp circuits uh, or 100 amp braided wire inside that same size conduit. You actually have to have larger conduit for that. And so when you're dealing with future proofing, you're, you're actually we're, we're talking uh, putting in larger conduit just to make sure that we're future proofing and we can take that charger out. We can replace it with a, a more powerful charger later on and just re-pull the wire and everything is fine. It makes the installation a lot easier on, on the electricians, a little bit cheaper on the actual owner itself. Now, when we're talking scalability, what that means is I can come in and actually install, let's say, two chargers at first. And I'll say, hey, building owner, I'm telling you, I'm and I say this to I'm blue in the face to all of my customers. I'm telling you right now, when you put these two chargers in, get ready because it's going to be a blast. You're going to have so much fun. And then you're going to come back to me in about six months. As a matter of fact, you might come back in about three months and ask for more charging, you know, for us to put in more chargers. So how about now, while we're ripping things up and we're doing the construction, um, we put in maybe a few more conduit sleeves um, and we just tap them. We, we, we cap them off. You won't even see that they're there. But when you do call us, 
uh, for additional chargers, well, it's going to be 60% less cost for us to add those chargers because we went ahead and we had the foresight to put in these extra conduit uh, tubes and basically sleeve that infrastructure in uh, prior to us actually needing it. Joe, wow. that is such a good point. I mean, um, I think everybody should get a class in this in school <laughs> because we use all use electricity, but so few people know how it works or where, like what that outlet in their wall and how it comes from. And your point about bigger conduit, yeah, it's not that expensive to do when you're doing the construction. So I urge you to listen to Joe if you are a developer, a building owner, even a homeowner. Like when you have that project open and you've got the wall open or the ground open, yeah, throw that bigger conduit in. You will thank Joe later because <laughs> uh, it's not a big deal to pull stuff through later, but it's a big deal, like you said, to open a wall or open the ground. Um, and so really perfect point there. Yeah, I mean, we've gone in front of municipalities, even state governments, and we've tried to show them, like, look, if you're in new construction and you're putting in this infrastructure, you can literally save close to 90 percent of the cost of putting in this infrastructure if you can get it done on the building side of things. You guys know that's common sense, right? I mean, there should be no reason why... Um, municipalities, states, governments aren't just putting this uh, hardcore right now uh, in, the, in their building codes. I, I, it, it's, still, it's still daunting the, the fact that uh, you can save 90% of the cost of putting in this infrastructure if you're doing it at a pre-construction level. That's a really good point as well. Um, so I want to talk because you have so much background knowledge and history on on dealing with you know not only the, the technical side of it, but also kind of the personal side and um, you know, like working with kind of corporate America for installations at, you know, places of work and also like hotels and stuff like that. What has it been like, you know, from the early days uh, moving on to now? Has there been a shift in the people you're talking to and what they're about? Yeah, especially nowadays. I mean, back in 2007, I created the company. Uh, Zach, you know, as well as I do, I mean, it takes you a, a number of years to kind of build things up and eventually get your first customer. Our first customer was a Tesla Roadster customer. We had a couple in 2009. We had a couple of conversion enthusiasts. We started that. Basically, I, I what I did was I, I followed a master electrician around and kind of learned exactly what he did. But we were birthed as an electric car charging station installation company. I had to learn how to become an electrical contractor. I mean, this is all that I was passionate about. I was like, this this has got to be, this. if this thing catches on, this has got to be valuable. I mean, this people need this service. Uh, and I knew that I was, uh, I, I was kind of gaining a little more traction in 2010, 2011, when the Nissan Leaf and Chevy Volt came out. Um, started really ramping up and doing a lot more charging station installs then. And then, of course, uh, the, the Model S hits in 2012. Tesla finds me and they're like, hey, we need as much uh, help as possible. Um, let let let's ha let's make it happen. So I was like, yeah, let's go. Uh, and so from there, we've kind of snowballed, uh, and uh, every year it's just been almost 66, 66 maybe a hundred percent growth sometimes year over year. But as far as what we've seen in the industry itself, there's been a significant change. I own a 2013 Nissan Leaf. Jesse, I think you pretty much. I'm not too Same sure. One. It was 2013. Yeah. Same, <laughs> one. Same one. Okay. Four bars, gone. Man, that thing is a workhorse. I love it. It's one of our fleet vehicles. We just use it for little short trips in there, but it's never failed me at all. And so that particular Leaf, you know, the, the, the older versions had 3.3 kW onboard charger. The newer ones have a 6.6 .6 kW onboard charger. And that's roughly about 30 amps. You know, if, you, if you're looking at a, a 30 amp charging station, you're looking at about a 7.2 kW charging station that you're, 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 you're needing to have to feed that car. So that way it meets the, the charging level and it maxes maximizes that utilization for the, the vehicle itself. We've seen the industry from 2010 to about 2000, I would say uh, about 2018 even, meet at that, that 30 amp level. Now we've seen the industry, the entire industry just lift up to 48 amps, uh, which is roughly a 60 amp circuit, uh, 48 amps continuous draw to the vehicle. And so we've seen actual onboard chargers on these vehicles actually move up to also match that rating. So five years ago, I was selling 90% uh, tier two uh, charging stations, which are between 7.7 .7 and 7.2 kW, uh, we we kind of break our, 
our, our level two charging into four separate tiers. Uh, tier one is more like your 16 amp charger for your Chevy Volt, uh, old school 3.3 kW onboard charger. Tier two is going to be for your 30 amp, 32 amp uh, car charger. And of course, your your tier four, uh, three is going to be anywhere between your 40 and 48 amp onboard charger. And then your tier four, the older generation uh, Tesla Model S's and X's used to have an, a twin charger option where they, they could take up to 80 amps uh, continuous. So we like to keep tier four kind of on its own. But that's that's we've kind of lined up those those four tiers. So when we're talking to a customer and we're actually discussing what type of vehicle they have, well, we have to know exactly what tier charger to, to offer that customer. And then also we, we try to tell them, look, you know, this one's 30 amps and your car is 30 amps, but this one here does 48 amps and it's a little bit over, it's about $200 more, but you're, you're, you're future proofing your electric fuel vehicle charging needs uh, by doing this. Because if you turn in that old car and let's say you get a newer electric car and now that car takes 48 amps, well, you don't have to call us again. You already have the car charger there and it works and everything matches. Everything's great. But we have seen a significant change from um, the previous years to that, you know, that 30 amp, 32 amp uh, home charger, um, it, it even uh, car chargers out in the wild to the 48 amp uh, option. Talk to me about what you've learned from businesses over the years. Um, I remember in the early days, it seemed like businesses didn't even know why they were installing chargers. <laughs> Um, but do they get it now? Do they see that actually they're getting increases in customers when they do it? I think what we've seen is we've seen a lot of high, let's say high rise downtown condos, right? They have the customer base um, that that they know that they're going to get some some pretty influential customers that are needing that uh, the, the electric charging infrastructure put in. And before back in 2014, 2016, you know, they were like, ah, you know, we'll, we'll get it when it comes. And, you know, that's more like, look, if we, we need to do this now, because maybe one of their clients had electric car charging, and we put it in from the building's electric panel um, to the, to that that uh, that client and the HOA had to take care of the building and all that stuff. And I think people just didn't want to be bothered. But what we're seeing is H HOA and buildings, they're actually losing customers if they, they're not providing that electric vehicle charging. And so the moment that they lose, a, let's say, a sale of a $900,000 uh, condo in downtown Miami, they're like, yeah, no, 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 we, we're, not, we're not doing this. We have to put in infrastructure. Now they're calling me left and right. And I'm like, hey, guys, look, this is great. Good thing is we already mapped out everything. The problem is that your prices have gone up 30%. So you guys are good. They're like, yeah, let's go. Let's do it. So what we're seeing, once, once they kind of have that reactionary mode then they're they're on board but something it's almost like they have to lose something something bad has to happen to them or people have to pick up the phone and call them every hour on the hour and like hey look these guys keep calling me i don't know what what they want they want charging you guys need to come over here we need some help right but that's just you know kind of downtown residential buildings if you look at uh commercial buildings retail hospitality uh you know hospitals uh churches i mean you can think of the the number of uh, of different verticals that we have to have this kind of specialized, almost tailored approach because not all charging fits all different scenarios. If you're talking to a gas station owner that wants to put charging stations, it's probably going to be DC fast charging because he wants to he wants to be able to, to get in and get out and, and keep rotating his customers. So I want to kind of talk about um, a common scenario that I think that a lot of our viewers run into. I hear about it a lot. They bought an electric car because they really wanted one and maybe they have charging at home, maybe they don't, but they want to convince their boss at work to put in electric car charging and they're, they're, you know, they're driving in every day in their Model 3 or their Bolt or whatever. And they're saying, you know, we got to get electric car charging in here. And it's the most hardest thing you can possibly do. You'd think that like your boss would go like, oh, of course, if, if it means that I get to keep my employees happy that I would do it. Um, what is the strategy like what because you must have seen some of this you must have seen where you know somebody called up begrudgingly saying like hi can you put in charging what's the strategy to try and like push them and and convince them and you know uh, allay their fears and answer their questions like kind of walk me through that process yeah i mean it, you know workplace charging is an employee benefit it's it's an amenity um but at the same time it is a um What's your turnover? You know, that's what I always ask them. You know, like, do you want to keep your 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 turnover as low as possible? Um, and if so, 
by offering that electric car charging for your customers or for, in this case, your employees, you can almost do the math and say that it's like an incremental raise for them. If you're buying an electric car and you come here and you're using our charging, um, and, and let's say if I'm giving the charging away for free, I've seen some business owners say that uh, and actually do that. And then other business owners will say, you know what, um, I'm going to charge you, but it, I'm only going to charge you cost. I'm not going to make any money off of you, but whatever it costs us, we're going to charge you back. And, and at that point, it's, it's very low uh, on the actual uh, employees themselves. But we, we are seeing that generally uh, when it comes to turnover, employee uh, employers do not like turnover. They like to keep uh, good talent in the doors when they have it, especially these days. Good talent is hard to find for them offering an amenity and also, you know, kind of the use case scenario where you can say, hey, look, I'm going to provide this to you guys. And if, if, if you really think about it, here's how much I'm actually saving you guys in fuel having to drive back and forth uh, these days to work. And of course, a lot of people are telecommuting and so forth and so on. So we've seen a drastic hit to the workplace uh, industry um, over the past about a year and a half, two years, where we just haven't really been doing that much workplace, uh, you know, charging. But I'll tell you now, I tell you this: uh, this past about maybe three three months, uh, it's just climbing. It's growing. I think people are, are going back to work. Uh, employers are, are kind of waking up. They understand that it's an amenity that they have to get because now, you know, that good talent is hard to find. So they're looking at all kinds of ways to just keep amenities and keep benefits, uh, so forth and so on, coming. Four hundred one k. You know, we'll, we'll do it all. We'll get insurance. We'll get electric car charging. And it's it's one of the easiest things that a business owner can do with regards to benefit wise for their employers um, that maybe some of them aren't even aware of. But it, it is definitely a huge benefit that they can do for their employees. Now, I, I want to ask about um, metering. How can how can a business owner or an HOA or anybody really charge for um the electricity that somebody uses. Do you need specific types of chargers? I mean, I, obviously, I've been to a charge point station before. Um, how does that work? Yeah, so ChargePoint has um, uh, has flex billing options for the the particular owner of the station. So if you're a business owner and let's say you want to charge uh, customers just for the same exact rate that you're charging, then you you kind of develop your pricing strategy for that particular charger uh, based on what it is you're you're trying to give to your employees. Um, we've seen some some employers um, charge let's say two dollars an hour uh, for 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 everything, and what they do is there's different pricing schemes that kind of offset the behavior that you're trying to get. You don't want employees sitting on the on the plug and they're fully charged in like two hours and then they're just squatting on the station. You want a, an alert to happen. You want these smart charging stations to be installed like a charge point, let's say CT4000. Um, the, basically, that will let you know, hey, you're finished charging. As a part of charging etiquette, it, it, is, it, it is suggested that you please move your car so that another person can come in. And if not, then let's say the car sits for another 10 minutes, they can start using flex billing to actually charge your account a lot more because you're not moving that car. So we've seen, even if you go to, uh, let's say, ChargePoint headquarters, the owner of ChargePoint, basically, he charges his employees just the cost. Uh, he, he used to. I'm not too sure if he does now. But uh, he, he used to charge just the employees just the cost of what it cost him uh, for, the uh, basically, the electricity that's going into their car. So we've seen uh, that there's different, when, when you're dealing with dumb chargers or smart chargers, dumb charging, you, you can't really reimburse for the power or whatnot. You just kind of have to give it away for free. It does its job. It just charges, but you're not going to be able to see, you know, who's charging or, or maybe ac have access control to give your employees, you know, little charging cards and then maybe only them can charge. And so there's a lot of things that you have to consider when it comes to like the cheap, dumb charging. Let's just give it away from everyone. But remember what I said, you're going to have other people coming in and, and plugging into that port and you're not going to know who's plugging in, when they're plugging in, if they're, if they're sitting or squatting on that station, so forth and so on. So having a smart charger, um, especially commercial wise, does designed for your, your workplace uh, application, it allows you to be a lot more flexible and have these contingencies in place where you're maximizing that util uh, utilization for all your employees. And then if I wanted to do that, if I was an employer and I was or a business owner and I was like, well, that sounds good. I want a smart charger that I can charge cost or I can charge over. Um, how would I go about doing that? Do I have to call up ChargePoint or can I can I call you? 
Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, we're located in 20 cities across uh, across the U.S., but we're basically we can do install anywhere. Uh, but we, we we generally have to use subcontractors for that. But uh, what you're getting with us is you're getting the, the the whole kit and caboodle. You're getting everything. You're getting system site design. We can purchase the station. We could uh, we do the installation of the station. We do the 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 activation, the provisioning. We also do the servicing of the station uh, as well to make sure that she's always up and running. And of course, you guys know how important that is to uptime on, on a lot of the these charging stations around. So in general, you have Smart Charge America. You can visit our website, smart, uh, www.smartchargeamerica.com. We have a uh, very, very easy sign-in process. Basically, you just go to our website, you click on commercial chargers, get a quote, you put your information in, and boom, we, ha we have a number of uh, sales agents that are specifically tailored to your charging verticals. They, they get in, they kind of work with you, they look at you know what your accessibility needs, what's your budget, how many do you want to put in. We kind of walk you through all this stuff that we've been talking about to make sure that we're getting you the best solution possible uh, for your needs. Remember, future proofing and scalability. We'll definitely try to convince you of that. Uh, but for the most part, when it comes to workplace charging, we're just trying to hurry up and get them as like charged up as fast as possible for their employees. And and Joe just brought up something really, he quickly mentioned it, but it's so important, which is the maintenance. Uh, because mm. I've, I can't tell you how many times I've pulled into one, especially at a public place like a train station, where they've got like four or eight chargers and seven of the eight are broken. Um, and it seems like no one is in charge of calling anyone to fix them. Mm. And so they just get like bags put on them and t duct tape and stuff. And it's like, yeah, business owner, you got to keep these things working. They do get dropped. They right. do get, you know, vandalized and broken. And if you don't have some way to quickly get them fixed, then EV drivers just don't want to come to your business anymore. Right. You get that bad plug share rating. That's hard to turn around. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I could tell you um, I've done a lot on the state legislative side of things uh, and even the federal talking with the Department of Energy on the allocation of funds that's coming down with this Build Back Better plan, uh, the $7.5 billion for charging infrastructure. It is critical that we have a spot there for service and maintenance of the charge in a long-term SLA or an agreement for whoever gets charging. You are required to keep those with an uptime of 98% or better. It's a battle because right now I'm fighting to help the charging stations that exist currently in the wild to pick those service uh, uptimes up. Uh, you know, they're averaging around 50, sometimes 60%. That's not acceptable. I mean, you have to be operating at Tesla's at 98, 99%. But the, the interesting thing is through our, our kind of discovery of this, we found that it's the ownership structure, really, that helps, um, you know, increase and boost that uptime. If you look at Tesla's supercharging network, well, they're fully integrated. Tesla owns every single one of those stalls, all, you know, 10,000, I don't know how many that they have in the U.S. now. But um, essentially, Tesla owns every single one of those. So they have a first glimpse. They have a real-time access point to that. And Jesse, you mentioned uh, in the headquarters, they have their screen that shows, you know, how many are, uh, how, how much charging they're, they're doing and how many CO2, you know, emissions that they're they're saving so forth and so on by having that 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 vertical integration between the supercharging network and them owning all of those stations they have a uh, better interest in keeping that network with a higher uptime 99 percent now when it comes to the badlands of course in the the general public charging infrastructure means you may have 700 charging stations across the the, the city but you also have 600 different owners uh, because not it's not all one owner of all the charging stations. And so depending on how much the owner cares about electric car charging, how much they budgeted, so forth and so on, when that charging station goes down, it's not really uh, on their, their biggest priority list to get it repaired. And so um, we're, we're trying to work with advocates and business owners in the cities that we're in now and to kind of start to get the service levels uh, up on these charging stations so that way we can kind of renew and re-inspire that, that feeling that a lot of us have been just scorned uh, with regards to public infrastructure. Wow. I mean, I was so excited to hear about the $7.5 billion, but on the flip side, just like you, I was really worried that like a lot of times when government does something, they just don't do it well. And Not I'm really spending. Exactly. Yeah. And I'm worried that like there'll be lots of level two chargers, but they'll be in bad places. They'll get, you know, broken um, and that they won't make 
make much sense. And so can you talk about that a little bit? Like what's, what are your feelings for this money? And, and do you think it's going to be great for EV drivers that we're going to have lots of great charging? Or do you think it's just going to be like put in the worst places? Uh, it's funny uh, you say that. I, I just got off the phone. We're doing a pilot program with the Department of Energy. So I'm very closely knitted to the Department of Energy and their, their charging uh, infrastructure team. Uh, basically, the way that they kind of look at uh, EV charging is almost like a tree. Um, they understand that 90 percent, maybe 80 percent, depending on your, your use case uh, of charging uh, is, is done at, at the home. Right. We understand that. And so that's almost like your root system, uh, your trunk. Uh, would be your DC fast charging infrastructure. And so they understand that that, that is extremely important and critical and you want to make sure it's long and you know you got the girth and you have enough charging stations out there uh, to, to make sure that the use case uh, for your city is being supported. But you also have this quite unique little thing with branches and all these little things on these branches. They're called leaves, you know, and so that would be the commercial level two charging. Uh, and so they see that there is there should be a higher propensity of us putting in a lot more of these level two charging at I guess particular spots all across the city where you could just use the top off model when you're going to the gym or the grocery store or, or church or, or wherever you're going. Um, you're basically topping off where that you know, where those assets are, or where those amenities are. We want to make sure that we're not leaving those people behind. And so the closest means for us to be able to do that is to put in, uh, you know, the, the home infrastructure, the DC fast charging infrastructure and the level two infrastructure. I'm really interested in your relationship with Tesla because I noticed on your last video about the Gen 3 charger, you were mentioning that in the beginning, like you said here, Tesla was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's go. And then there was like the slowdown during, I think, around the Model 3 ramp. And does, is that because... From what I've learned about Tesla, like they pull people off of things when they need to focus them on something else. Do you think people were being, you know, their engineers were being pulled away from the charging side to work on the car side? I think Elon said it best. I think production is hell. And he saw that firsthand in 2018 with the Model 3. And you can see a significant jump in our in our charging. I mean, we were going up and up and up. And in June of 2018, I mean, we just we just spiked. And it was it was because of that production. And I think that somewhere around of like cost allocation and, and making sure that he's got to be able to balance a number of things. But the most important thing at that point in time was um, the actual infrastructure for the uh, Model 3s to be uh, in rolling and ramping up that production. So, yeah, I mean. It, it didn't really hurt anything because a majority of, the, of, of our installs are done at the home when it comes to Tesla. Uh, a, a lot of our, our, our Tesla customers, I mean, they basically find us on Tesla's website. Uh, Tesla will send them information saying, hey, you know, real quick, you know, call Smart Charge America. Uh, these guys can actually take care of you. And, and of course, you know that it takes about two, maybe six months for the car to come in anyway. So it's best to hurry up and call us so we can kind of get the ground running on here because we, we can do it overnight. We can do it the next day, but we have to have a lot of information for us to deploy and dispatch our guys out. Um, but for the most part, uh, we have a very easy form. Customer basically just goes to our website. They put in their their information, tell us a little bit about their car. Uh, they basically go to their garage and they, they can upload photos. We're giving them sample shots of exactly what to do. They hit submit. We basically have a team of EV enthusiasts, master electricians working, estimating, designing, making this whole thing happen for them. And as far as like the, the, the customers themselves, we're seeing that Tesla customers <laughs> they they are waiting to the last minute now to call us. Whereas before they didn't wait to the last minute. They 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 got the message of like, all right, cool, let's go, and we'll put their charging in, and they wouldn't get the car for like another two months. And so we were just so appreciative of, of them uh, getting the car that our job is to be able to basically nobody understands watts and amps and kilowatts and uh, you know they, they, they volts. Nobody understands that, but but they do understand like range per hour. Right? How many miles of range uh, per hour will I get while I while I charge my car? Okay. Well, you you have a Model Y, uh, so you're going to get uh, at 48 amps with this charger. You're going to maximize your your utilization for that charging station to match your your onboard charger for your vehicle. So you're going to get about 42 miles of range per hour. So that means if you drive 88, you know, let's say 84 miles a, in, a day, and you come back in, you charge, it, it'll be fully charged in two hours. They're like, really? Like, yeah. It's like, wow. I, I should have did this a long time ago. So. Basically, with, with Tesla, I mean, I'd say a good 70% of our business comes from Tesla. And that's not 
that that's very analogous of what Tesla, how Tesla dominates the market with regards to EV. So it, it, there's no wonder that our stuff parallels that uh, of what Tesla does. It seems like you almost answered it there. It feels like there was this early adopter group that really got into all the you know <laughs> nitty gritty of kilowatts and amps and got it and, and was and, looking forward to installing that charger. Right. And then we've moved <laughs> into the Model 3, Model Y group, which is more like it's just a car and I don't know anything about it. Yeah. And it seems like they're the ones who kind of wait till they get the car and then are like, oh, I guess <laughs> I need a charger at home. Like, is that what you've been seeing that they kind of need almost to get the car first to understand it? Yeah, I mean, it was a uh, like before, I'd say even before 2018, th when we were talking to Tesla customers, they kind of knew everything about the electric car, but they still didn't know everything about the electric car charging. It was very different. So we had to kind of make sure that we pieced together and then they kind of the light bulb hits and they're like, oh, yeah, no, no that's what he meant by that. Yeah. That's that's awesome. The worst thing that happens is when uh, the Tesla guys at the the Tesla showroom or whatever they're like, oh yeah, Neba fourteen fifty. It'll cost uh, about two hundred dollars to get put in. It's like, no, dude, don't say anything with regards to cost because. Power over distance equals cost when it comes to electric car charging, period. And not all homes are built the same. Not all homes are wired the same. Every single home is a custom install. Um, and so when you're looking at that, um, most of the time, those early adopting, uh, early adopter Tesla customers, they, they were not as price sensitive. And so a majority of the time they had bigger homes, they had uh, a lot more energy uh, requirements inside the home. And so for us to be able to pull uh, our, our, our line from the panel to the actual charging station mounting point, I usually generally tell people if they can budget about 3% of the car's value, um, on the electric car charging for system for their home, that's probably the best means of doing that. Now, with a standard deviation of about 90%, it could be a little bit less, could be a little bit more, but generally about 3% of the actual value of the car is what you need to, you need to be able to save and budget for setting up your electric car charging. Because there is permits, you know, sometimes there's permits involved. Uh, there's the station itself. Uh, sometimes you have to buy the station. Sometimes it's, the station's not always gifted to you in the, in the car, especially now that Tesla kind of retracted that mobile connector, um, you know, from from the equation on that. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, in general, before Tesla customers were, they're a lot more savvy, but they still needed help with kind of being it, walking them through, through the benefits of electric car charging and, and kind of connecting those dots. But now uh, between 2018, since the the, the, the the Model 3 ramp, we've seen a lot of people like they don't like half of them, they don't, I'm not saying that they don't know that they have an electric car, but man, they, they, they're, they're completely disconnected from how their vehicle works. And so we're encouraging them and, and kind of teaching them some cool things about the vehicle themselves and the charging. Whereas before we, the person that we were talking to, they knew everything about the car. Like there's nothing, there's nothing surprising there, but they, they, you know, having that connection on, on the charging station really connected things and it made it a little bit easier. It let it made it a little bit more comfortable for them to be able to engage in the technology in that way. And lastly, Joe, I want to talk to you about um, what happens to a lot of homeowners, I think, which is they get the car, they really know about what their panel has in it in terms of amps. And then they kind of learn, uh oh, I've got a hundred amp panel, let's say, and I can't really add a 40 amp sub panel or 60 amp sub panel. Talk about smart panels, because we just talked to um, Span, uh, the company that makes these smart panels. Is that something your your crew is able to start utilizing more and more now? Um, because a smart panel, for those who don't know, would allow you to keep the number of amps that you have in your house, but be able to um, allocate it, it. Yeah. yeah, smartly, kind of like you were talking about earlier with the Gen 3 charger. Yeah, I mean, most of the charging systems these days, especially um, with the, let's say, the, the Gen 3 wall connector, and we've seen also with the charge point unit, some of the ENLX units, the wall box units, they have the, the, the ability to toggle their power usage uh, on the actual charging stations themselves. So um, some of them can, you know, go as high as 80 amps continuous all the way down to maybe 12 amps continuous. So that helps uh, in the provision where you have if you see like most of downtown, most of like the small uh, inner city homes, the little bungalow homes, they have a smaller util like utility service than some of the suburban areas on the outside, uh, the ring around the, the cities. And so for some of those smaller bungalow homes that only have the 100 amp service, uh, we may be able to come in and put a, a, a 20 amp breaker in there and toggle that that, that charging station power down uh, to let's say, you know, 20 amps with a 16 amp continuous draw. And, and the, te the, the customer might not, not, they might not like it, but at the same time, we're not doing a, a $4,800, $5,800 service upgrade uh, to bring them from 100 to 200. There's no need. We try to walk them through kind of their driving habits, uh, you know, 
where they park the car, how they park their car, and then essentially like, all right, well, the car is going to sleep for 12 hours. Uh, you're going to park it at 7 a.m., uh, 7 p.m. You're going to get get back in it at 7 a.m. Um, she's going to sleep for 12 hours, so it shouldn't really matter if the car charges in two hours or six hours. Uh, and so all we have is the ability to charge in six hours. And once once we kind of explain that to them, some of the the newer charging stations, they remember again, they're able to toggle their power usage, which doesn't affect the panel as much. But the smart meter these smart panels that are coming out, they give us the ability to be able to shift the load inside the panel. Remember we talked about the, the, the inspector, uh, how the inspector comes out and he sees a 100 amp panel. He's like, okay, well, this panel can never exceed 80 amps. Um, and that's 80 amps with regards to the breakers that are currently in the panel not what's going on, not what's currently being used. And so again, if the inspector goes out there and they see a span uh, panel there, then they're gonna be like, oh, this is great because the span panel's got a lot of breakers in there, but they're not always being used at any given time. And that panel basically ensures that all of, everything that's being used, it'll never exceed the capacity of that panel. The span panel is the only one that I've seen to do that, and they are an amazing products uh, out there. So, yeah, but the, the charging stations themselves, they do have the ability to kind of toggle that power usage. And so between the, 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 the power toggling uh, and the, the, the smart meters like span, you can do a lot of things and really save a lot of money on that electric car charging infrastructure uh, for your home. <laughs> wow. Joe, this has been a really awesome conversation. Yeah. I feel like we could talk for days and days more about this. If only you had like a podcast or something. <laughs> Yeah. So our new podcast, Charge Life, uh, we we basically get into all things on a granular level, um, a little bit more focused on like home charging, let's say destination charging, let's say commercial charging, what to do before you get commercial charging. We, these are some of the things to consider, maybe 20 different factors to, to consider when you're, when you're looking at purchasing a home charging station. Like we get really granular into all things electric car charging. So the name of the podcast is Charge Life. Um, again, we, we just shot our first three episodes. We're going to start rolling that out. And I think it's really important for us to be able to just at, at some point, just everything that we're doing out in the field, it's really important for us to just, just regurgitate it out to our customers and just on just unvarnished, just as much value as we can give to those people that are interested in electric cars and electric car charging. We're just trying to do our part again, to move the needle uh, on climate change. That's, that's our goal. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Joe, for all of the work that you've done, both installing all of the chargers that I think do at the beginning, but you, I mean, you're talking to the Department of Energy. It sounds like you're explaining to them what they need to do, which I am so grateful of because I mean, uh, let's face it, you you have uh, $7.5 billion that in part you're deciding where that m money goes. It's yeah. not a little thing. And I'm so glad that you've... Uh, you know, taking the time and your team is taking the time to build up your expertise and and get to this point where I feel like I could throw anything at you and you'd be able to build me a car charger there, which I'm very excited and impressed. And if anyone is out there who's either on the commercial side or the residential side and you have questions or you want to install chargers, I urge you to reach out to Joe and his team at Smart Charge America. I mean, these guys have been doing it for years. Zach and Jesse, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. You guys are pioneering uh, everything that you guys are doing. Uh, we're all better for it. Trust me. Me. I know things get hard for you guys. I've seen you guys do the split, uh, you know, videos and all that stuff. When things get hard, just trust me. What you guys are doing out there, I, I can't really thank you all enough for just the exposure. You guys are just kind of airing it all out and making sure people are aware of what's going on out there, not only for EVs, but infrastructure and news, so forth and so on. So you guys do a lot to pioneer that way for everyone. And so we are so grateful and so thankful for you guys doing what you do every day, day in and day out. It means a lot coming from you guys. So we really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Joe. This is great. And I can't wait. Uh, hopefully when we're out there in Austin picking up our Cybertruck soon, we'll be uh, stopping <laughs> by and uh, having some fun. Yeah, come and see us. We got a, a, a charging station museum. We got the old EV1 charger uh, that's up for view. If you guys want to take a look at that, we got a couple of Roadster chargers. Um, we're, I'm trying to get my hands on like a, uh, an 1890, you know, old Porsche charging station. Uh, you know, the ones you saw in the in the Peterson Museum. That's that's the coup de grace. So I'm still waiting for that chance to get a hold of that one. But um, other than that, yeah, we'd, we'd love to have you guys anytime you guys want to come on over. Our doors are wide open for you all. Thank you so much.